all these human beings made the image likeness of God that are born onto this planet. It's God's planet. Okay, the wealth exists. And every stitch of technology comes from above. God gave us our brain, and it's with our brain and with our hands we created the technology. All the infrastructure, okay, I could go on all day naming all the technologies that exist, all the transportation technologies, all the bridges and buildings and sewer systems and water systems and electrical grids. I could go on all day with various infrastructure. And the same thing, you know, look at the factories, the stuff we're producing from the factories. I mean, it, it's, ridic it's at ridiculous proportions now. Folks, the wealth exists in the stuff. <laughs> the wealth exists primarily in a willing workforce. And who can deny we, we don't have a willing workforce? People are not poor anymore because of laziness. You know, there was a tenet, a precept regarding, you know, hardship. Well, if, you know, if the rulers keep the people hungry, let's say, that's imposing hardship on the people, it spurs innovation. Well, that's a belief system from a bygone era. We don't need to embrace that philosophy anymore. There's not any kind of technology out there. There's no kind of innovation out there that's going to solve social economic injustice. Not when it's being forced down our throats from policy that's coming from above. So, folks, do you understand the, the common denominator I'm trying to get to, folks? It's, it's called egalitarianism. It's called being willing to let everybody's ship rise in a tide of prosperity. Now, who can be opposed to that? So again, where does the wealth come from? First and fun foremost, fundamentally, you have to understand the wealth already exists. It's in the stuff. And if there is plenty of stuff, and there is, and I'm not just talking about essential human needs, like plenty of clean drinking water, plenty of healthy food, plenty of adequate housing for everybody on the planet, but there's also plenty of niceties. There's also plenty of clean energy. The only reason we don't have clean renewable energy at our fingertips is because the, the powers that be don't want it at our fingertips. This is 17th, 17th or 18th century technology, the, the ability to produce he, te, uh, artificial hydrogen. Okay, so the idea that we couldn't have miniaturized hydrogen production units under the hood of our car and all we had to do was fill our tank with water is preposterous, okay? I don't buy it, okay? There is, this earth is spinning at over a thousand miles an hour. And the idea that we can't tap into that enormous power that is enveloping the earth is preposterous. This is the kind of thing that, that Tesla understood. He understood that Electricity is ubiquitous. It's all around it. And he had a method of taking that out of the air, out of the atmosphere, and, and, and to store it. Okay, so everybody could have one of these devices on their, on their homes. Okay, this is the reality we could have today, all over the world. Plenty of everything for everybody. Clean, not hurting the planet, protecting the planet at the same time. Do you think they want you to believe what I'm telling you? They want you to think I'm nuts. But I'm not, folks. I've researched this because I, you know, I'm a simple man, and I just like to get to the bottom of things. I like to say, is this problem solvable or is it not? And if not, why not? And then I discovered, wow, I see why the problems are not only not solved, but they're per perpetuated because it's in, in the interest of the powers that be. It makes them more relevant to have the problems, to have the chaos that comes with the problems. You understand? It makes them relevant. It makes us need them. Oh, you, we need, you know, we need a, a powerful military. We need powerful law enforcement. We need, um, you know, all the jails, and we need all the laws, and we need all the draconian measures. We need Big Brother to help us because we, we can't solve our own problems. We're overwhelmed. You know, we the people are just incompetent morons, and we can't take care of our problems. Therefore, we're letting our brothers and sisters die unnecessarily out in the cold. And that's key to understand. We have to all admit it's unnecessary suffering that's being inflicted on us. And they're doing it with poverty. It's a matter of fact. I mean, everybody knows. Guys like my dad knew. Guys like Alex Jones know. They know about the Cloward and Piven strategy. They know this is intentional. It by the policies, they're doing it. Guys like JFK understood this. He was an... A, a, a devout egalitarian with his, you know, competing currency, the silver notes, really going for the jugular in terms of, you know, 
setting America on, on, on a path to universal, full prosperity, full employment, you know? I mean, we've all got to ask, why can't we have full employment? That alone would be a huge step toward ending poverty. This is the one thing that these people that are running roughshod over us cannot tolerate. They cannot tolerate the end of poverty. They cannot tolerate a, a realistic work week. They've got to keep us convinced that, oh no, you you know, a 40-hour work week, 40-hour work week, do it, do it, do it. You know, this is what the standard should be in order for you to make an adequate income that satisfies you, you know, that makes your life comfortable. You need to do this for you. And folks, all I'm saying is, look, if there's pain to be had and that pain is, you know, wow, we don't have enough work, horror of horrors. I mean, what am I saying here? You know, we supposed to beat our breast, you know, pound our head against the wall that there's not enough work. I, how absurd. Look what they've done to us. See how they've mind effed us all to the nth degree. Why can't we share the pain, if that's pain, okay, to have a reduced work week, but to have pay that's based on universal prosperity, to have checks and balances, to have accountability, to have sound currency. It involves a living wage, not for some, but for everybody. You can't say that it's starting pay. Minimum wage is criminal wage. It induces crime. Everybody out there, I've heard Alex Jones say the same thing, that if these people are living on such low pay, they got to go get welfare to supplement their income. So, I mean, on one hand, you know, you, you can't speak out of both sides of your mouth. you got to say, look, what is the reality here? Let me face it. How do we end poverty? This is their biggest threat to the establishment. That's why they went after Martin Luther King Jr., okay? What was he doing in Memphis, okay, when he got shot? Okay, he wasn't, he wasn't marching at the time he got killed, but he was there doing this march, trying to help the garbage men get a fair shake. And what is a fair shake? A fair shake, a living wage, should be based on what it costs to, for example, comfortably purchase a home, a median-priced home, in your locale, okay, to comfortably support a family so that your wife can stay home and look after the kids, to be a housewife if she wants to be. Hey, if she wants a career, that's fantastic. You share the joy of raising the children. I took great joy. I was a single dad for many years, and I just, I wouldn't have missed a day of raising my daughters. I, I just, I feel so sorry for mom that she was out of the picture during that period. But God knows, I just had a great time. I wouldn't have missed it for all the tea in China. Just had the time of my life raising my daughter. And, uh, you know, so, you know, the idea that we've got to accept what's being crammed down our throats and at least not understand and recognize it and speak truth to power. I'm a nonviolent guy. I say everything that's on my mind. And, and the reason I, I feel free to say everything that's on my mind is because I am a nonviolent guy. And I'll go so far as to use the P word. Yes, I'm a pacifist. Does that equate to a coward? No, I'm not a coward. But I say everything I want to say. Okay, folks, I'll do what a man has to do. If I see, you know, women, children, the weak, handicapped, whoever it is, the vulnerable, uh, being picked on, I want to lash out. And I am going to accost and confront anybody I see doing that. Maybe it... All my life I wasn't like that. Maybe I was more cowardly and uncertain, lacked confidence. But at this point in my life, I will, and even if it gets me hurt. But I believe God is with a man at that point. You know, that a man in his right mind will confront evildoers, and if necessary, will use violence. I mean, after all, if the evildoers are using violence, God understands, you know, we've got to, you know, meet fire with fire. We've got to, you know, at least capture this, this, this enemy of humanity, like Hitler, for example, and confine them, you know, until they, they become their right, you know, drive the demons out, so to speak, you know, like Jesus used to do. Whatever you want to call it, we've got to do I don't believe in capital punishment. I believe capital punishment is premeditated. It's the epitome of premeditated first-degree murder, okay? It's that simple, folks. I mean, we've all, you see how easily we all get confused about stuff, and if you're confused, you are deceived. Okay, but yes, I, I am not a proponent of, of capital punishment. And I just, I like the Hell, Hell Lindsay report, you know. This is a guy I really admire and respect. I like Christians 
uh, for the most part, if they're not hypocrites, if they're really speaking the truth, and, and they've got to know the truth. And if they're deceived, I'm not condemning them, but I'm telling them, look, you've got to take another path in your thinking. You've got to see this differently. But, you know, people speak out against democracy, they'll say, well, that's like two sheep, two wolves and a sheep deciding on what's for dinner. Well, then what's your, what are you saying there? Are you saying that it's right that the sheep uh, should decide what's for dinner? If he wants to eat the two wolves, that should be his prerogative? I mean, that's kind of what you're saying there. So let's, you know, come out of Babylon, like it's written in the Bible, which, which is symbolic of confusion. We've got to come out of confusion. We've got to admit, what, you know, if we see that we're mind screwed, then we've got to admit it, confess it, and, you know, don't let our false pride go up and, and prevent us from making progress, from advancing and improving, you know, ourselves and becoming more like the person God would mold us into, our character. You know, we want to emulate God. We want to imitate, you know, what we really believe in our heart and mind about God. And you get that on your knees. You get that, you know, quietly by asking, you know, by understanding your need. It's very important for everybody to understand how much you need God. Admit that. It's not wrong to admit that you're weak and needy. You're a human. You're fallible. You're a mortal. You're born in, with a body of death into this world of that's run basically by Satan. It's run by the spirit of Satan. Jesus said these things. He said, the prince of this world is Satan. And he compared money to a false god. And he told us that we cannot serve two masters. You'll either hate the one and love the other, or vice versa. And you know, I've really discovered that I hate evil. I hate the concept. I don't hate a living being, but I hate what it does to people. And confusion and deceit is its method of operation. And we've all been confused and deceived into believing that we need money. We can't live without money. Well, I ask you, what if we did, you know, just go back to a bartering system and said, well, maybe that was better after all. And then you'd say, well, then how would these uber wealthy, you know, contain all their power in terms of the money? Because we all know that money in this world is power. You know, because it allows you to purchase anything you want. It's great power to purchase all the services, all the commodities you, you aspire to. You know, whatever it is at any time. But suppose these people had to be invested in all those commodities. Let's say they had to go out and just sink all their wealth into... Uh, you know, property, real estate, and niceties, and trinkets, you know, ships, and planes, and whatever, you know, go on all day again. But you understand how that would change the paradigm? That would be a lot better at this point in history. But you know, the way that guys like JFK saw that we could do this is through sound currency. And sound currency, really to understand it, is very simple. It's based on capitalist supply and demand precepts and principles and laws. And it requires a couple of things. It requires accountability. First and foremost, it requires checks and balances. It requires saying, hey, we are going to try to make progress across the board. This means everybody is going to get a, a more fair shake. That's progress. That's improving the lot for not some, for not any special interest groups or groups of special interest groups that you know are picking on the downcast the ones that are being picked on the poor that are not poor because they're lazy okay they're poor because of this paradigm you know prove to me otherwise give us sound currency for a decade and see if things don't improve for the poor see if once you take away the taboo because it's taboo to be poor and it makes people want to drop out, to be misfits, and say, you know what, I, you guys repulse me. You know, this game is rigged, and I don't want to play it. And who can say it's not rigged? Socialist or capitalist, you got to admit this game is rigged up one side and down the other and to the nth degree. So a lot of people drop out because they don't want to fit in. And Jesus said that's okay. He said the people that hate their lives in this world, these are the ones that are going to be blessed. He said to preach the good news, the gospel, to the poor. Because they had the most to look forward to when Jesus is ruling this world. Okay, because, you know, if I've learned one thing over the years. It's that God is an egalitarian. So we all have to admit that. That God believes in equal rights for everybody, just like the American Constitution. 
you know, that embraces this idea that all men are created equal, and this is the only philosophy, the only credo that we can live by that's all ever going to unify all of us, that we're all in this thing together, and who could say we're not? We're one race, the human race. So fundamentally, we've got to get that. We've got to really understand just how profoundly we've been messed up. Again, back to sound current.